On today's episode of the podcast, we'll be talking with Rocket Jump Ninja. Now, most of you will know Zai from his incredibly successful YouTube channel where he reviews mice. He's recently flipped the script and become the mouse maker himself. In collaboration with Extrify, he's released the MZ1 or Zai's Rail, which is fantastic, and I definitely recommend that you check that out. Now, he's also a science fiction novel writer as well. He's just generally an all-round interesting person, and I feel like he's somebody that really has it figured out in terms of understanding how to live a fulfilled and happy life. So on top of all of the mouse talk and the quake talk, we talk a lot about life and his philosophies and you know, how he looks at self-improvement. It's overall a fantastic conversation. So without further ado, here is Zai. As an introduction to who you are through the, the lens of quake and how it's impacted your life, where would you, where would you start? I mean, start at the beginning because it's the best story, isn't it? The fact that I started out with Quake 2 Capture the Flag and just before that I had never really stayed with one game before. And then as soon as Quake came along, all the other games just couldn't compare. There's something so profound and amazing and crazy about Quake that it just it locked me in. I was like, I am just now a Quake player. And I've been like that for 23 years now. Have you managed to convert anybody that you've, you know, that you've seen through the comments or any feedback that you've gotten from your fan base into Quake? I'm curious. Yeah, there's actually been plenty. I think one of the problems with Quake these days is that it just doesn't have the exposure that other games have. But you look on my channel, there's plenty of people saying, what is this game? How do I get it? Where do I get it? And, you know, is it hard to learn? Is there a high skill ceiling? Like, what? give me details because they just fall in love with seeing the gameplay and just the fast movement. I think that's so rare. And you don't have the fluidity uh, in other games that you do get in Quake. It's a very stop-start, I think. I mean, in CSGO, for example, you actually have to stop to aim better, right? So this is something that you don't even think of in Quake. You put me in CSGO, I don't stop moving. My aim is just like, I'm right on it. Why am I hitting? Like, yeah, because you have to stop to actually aim better. So Quake has this totally different, very unique, fast-paced shoot from the hip, just go at it so you can aim the best sort of gameplay to it, that it still appeals to a lot of the new generation. They just haven't seen it before. So yeah, a lot of the people that you see in game now, other than the old school guys, are actually just from my channel, which is really cool to see. Yeah, what is it about Arena FPS that, that hasn't made it to the modern day of esports? So I actually saw a really good answer to this because I've been thinking about this for a long time. I even have a video on my channel saying, oh, we need a new mode and you should just do this. And it sounded good, but then someone pointed out the reason that Arena FPS is probably not doing well is because there's no like instant reward. You play League of Legends, you go through the levels, you level up, you're killing minions, so you're okay. Even if you can't kill the other champions, you can still kill something and you still feel like you're achieving. In Quake, it's brutal. For a new player, you go in, you either get a kill or you don't have fun. Picking up weapons doesn't have the same appeal as, say, leveling up and killing minions. And then when you get the battle royales, you have the looting, like you run around, that's when the weapons do feel like you're actually achieving something. So you like, oh, what armor, what items, what things am I going to get this time? And it's kind of exciting in that regard. Jump in Quake, you pick up weapons, but then you probably just die instantly because there's a lot of old school guys running around just killing you straight away. And then you play Jewel, you'll never get a kill on an experienced person because they've already got all the items, they know exactly where they are, they know the timings, they know everything. So I think it's just a lack of reward for the person just jumping into the game, what can they do early on that's fun? CSGO, I think you get a bit of a reward with the money and then you can buy a cooler gun and say, oh, now I can do this. So there's still that sense of achievement early on, whereas Quake really needs to focus on that. I think if we can get Quake having that instant gratification, I think it could actually make it a comeback. I think that's all it's missing because everything else is great. The movement's great. The lore is great, the gameplay just phenomenal with the rocket jumping and cool things that you can do. Now with Quake Champions, with all the different abilities, it's got all the makings for a great game. It's just missing that one little thing of giving players a sense of achievement early on. There seems to be a lot, a lot of obstacles and I feel like, I don't know if you thought about this as much as me because I desperately want a reader of FPS to kind of be more at the forefront. Again, we have Quake Champions and the Pro League, but it seems like that's very much just sort of, it's basically on an, it's like, you know, just on an island by itself. It's like Hawaii. It's just over there. It's kind of nice. You can go there every so often whenever you want, but it's really far out of the way and it's not really connected to anything. Um, but it's kind of nice when you get there. Um, 
and uh, otherwise people don't seem too too interested. So, yeah, do you have any other thoughts on on what what you would want to see happen, and or how you would envision the, uh, a future with with an arena FPS game and how that would work? Yeah, sure. I mean, microtransactions, the value of things in game. I remember people were complaining about Quake Champions charging. I think it was like sixteen dollars for a weapon skin. And even I thought that was high because, you know, as Quakers, we're used to just buying the game outright and we get everything. We may have to buy like a, an expansion pack at some point, but that's it. We get everything up front at a fraction of the cost when it actually comes down to like, if you bought everything in that game, it'd be hundreds of dollars. Or you can just pay the hundred dollars from the old times and get everything. So for us, it was high. But then you look at League of Legends, there's like $35 skins. And even more, if you buy everything, people are spending hundreds of dollars per season. It's not even just a once off, it's per season. So the value I think comes from the exclusivity, but that only matters when you've got a huge player base. If you just come out onto the market and say, oh here, we spent $10,000 making a weapon skin, please buy it for $20. People are gonna be like, why? There's like a hundred people in this game. Who am I gonna show it off to anyway? So I think it goes back to like just getting the audience. Audience is king. You have all the players in the world, you are king. League of Legends is top dog. Uh, Fortnite, obviously, very much up there. So these guys, I mean, this, there's a difference between what's actually going to make a game that people want to play and what's going to make a game that's successful marketing-wise. Two different topics. The, what I said was actually about the gameplay. You need to give people that instant gratification reward, something to level up with early on so they feel like they're actually achieving something and not just wasting time dying. The marketing, on the other hand, that's a huge question. Uh, there's a saying, 50% of marketing works, 50% of marketing doesn't work. Which is which? Nobody seems to know. How did Fortnite beat out, uh, what's it called, PUBG? I don't know. Uh, they seem very similar. Fortnite had the cool aspect of building, I guess. But PUBG was first. And the first usually gets a bit of priority. So I don't know. They marketed it in such a way that reached a big enough audience, I guess, kind of like TikTok these days. They're not really reaching people that are spending a lot of money, not their own money anyway. I think it's a lot of kids on there. But marketing and all that doesn't look at anything but the numbers. So if you can get your audience, even if the, uh, the funny way of saying it, nine-year-old PewDiePie, I think he used to joke about that all the time, all my audience were nine-year-olds. It's like, yeah, but the millions of views. And then when he goes to marketers and doing sponsors and all that, they're just going to say, yeah, all right, what's your demographic? Uh, how many views can you get us? All right, good. Here's millions of dollars. We'll work with you. So you're actually getting a game out there that's going to be marketed in such a way that it's going to get those numbers that are going to make everyone else say, oh, yeah, we should get, invest in time in this and we should buy this stuff. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. I wish I could tell you the answer. If I knew it, I would have told Hit Software, Sincara, all them straight away because obviously i want quake to, quake to succeed as well but i don't know the answer fortnite did incredibly well epic games phenomenal they were always second fiddle to quake and now they're the top dogs i'm like come on it software was meant to be the king just quickly we got into quake back in the day because it had the best 3d engine we'd ever seen it was beautiful graphics people were playing quake just for that and then we got into the gameplay and went oh wow this gameplay can actually match the graphics so we stuck with it. And then ever since then, Quake has just sort of been, I don't know, we need our Lord and Savior, John Carmack back. He was the man, he was the one that was always, this is the absolute best of the best, the cream of the crop or whatever that saying is. This is what Quake was rep representing and now I'm not sure what it is. I agree with you, you definitely want to see you know, a return, a return of the king, but We'll, we'll just have to wait. Maybe we'll be old and gray, but I, f I feel like at some point, at some point, the gameplay will come back because the, you can't. The, the gameplay is the gameplay. It's like at the end of the day, it's just certain rule sets, and it, what we know that it works. So it's just how how is it packaged and how is it presented that really is the question um, to to get that broader appeal. But we know the gameplay is everyone who has seen the gameplay really loves it and loves watching it. So it's I feel like it's just a matter of time. Um, but with that said. Um, how did you get into reviewing mice? I'm sure this is probably a question you've answered quite a lot, but is there some background as well as to what was, you know, who were you as well at the point in which you decided to review mice? You know, so we, you know, we've established, of course, you're an avid Quake player and 
then you decided to invest a lot of time in content creation. Why, like, why did you decide to do that and why reviewing and why mice in particular? So I've always, okay. So to explain this, go back to the start. I started with Quake 2 CTF, which was on a 350 ping for me. I lived out in the sticks. I had a terrible connection. So I didn't care that much about aim, but then I got on cable. And then I got into Rocket Arena 2, which is basically starting with all weapons and it goes in rounds like CSGO and you just fight it out, see who's got the best aim and best command of the weapons. And Quake 2 CTF died out and Quake 3 CTF captured the flag. It didn't really take off. It wasn't as fun for me. So I kind of just got stuck in Rocket Arena 3. So Quake 3, Rocket Arena, start with the weapons and just really focused on aim. And because of that, I started buying mouse pads and mice and just testing out like which one's good for me and which one isn't. Am I using the right one? I don't know. And then I never watched reviews or anything. Like I didn't even know that was a thing. And then years and years later, I mean, we're talking over decades, by the way. This was 2002 Rocket Arena 3 up until about 2014. So it's a 12-year gap there where I was actually just testing out mice and figuring them out. And I was playing this guy, good friend of mine, very good player. And I was like, I'm, I swear I could aim better. Like I should be able to beat this guy. He's not that much better than me. Why am I losing all the time? And I got so frustrated that I just, I went through my entire history and said, okay, when was aiming my best? It's like when I was using the Razor Diamondback and I was using the Razor Death Adder at the time. It's like, why was the Diamondback better than the Death Adder? I'm like, size? Like, could it be like the death adder is just too big for me? So I said, okay, well, let's get a small mouse and let's try this. Did my research. I watched, I actually started watching reviews on YouTube and I couldn't find any with the experience that I had. They were good reviewers, so good guys. I didn't have any hate for them, but I was like, you guys are not speaking my language. Like, you haven't shown me any gameplay. You haven't shown me your aim. I don't know if I can even trust anything you say, but I'm pretty confident that the Logitech G302 is a good mouse. So I'm going to get that one anyway. So I went out and got it. And guess what? I suddenly started destroying this friend of mine in game. He could not beat me. I'm like, here we go. It was the size of the mouse. It wasn't so much the weight or anything. It was just the size. I felt like I actually had control again after all these years. And I thought, you know what? I really wanted a review by someone with, at the time, I think it was 16 years Quake experience. So I was like, I'm going to put out a review just for the people like me who are looking for the, who might be looking for a mouse like this. And I did that. And then I just left it. I walked away. I went back to playing and doing my thing. In six months, I had got 20,000 views. No advertising. Didn't even do anything, like didn't promote it. I just put it on YouTube and let it fly. And I got all these good comments too. I'm like, okay, this is something. But at the time, I wasn't trying to go pro. I wasn't a player. Like I've never been a full-on Quake guy as such. I'm competitive in everything I do. I play basketball. I always wanted to win. I hated losing. And in Quake, I was the same thing. So I was never trying to be pro, but I was always trying to be the best I could be. So that's why I had that interest in mice and pads and so on. So uh, it wasn't about being pro, but when I saw the view count, I wasn't even thinking career. I wasn't trying to be a reviewer, but I've been writing novels for the last 20 years. And I thought if I had just put an advert for my books on that one video, I would have had 20,000 people knowing that this book exists and they could go get it. So I'm like, all right, I got to go buy more mice and do more videos and put adverts on my book for my books on these videos. So if you go back to the original Rocket Jump Ninja videos, every single one has an advert for my books at the end of it. So I've never actually tried to be a reviewer. It was only once people were like, hey, you're really good at this. You should do it more often. And I got, you know, over 7,000 subscribers, companies started sending me products. I'm like, and I started actually making money through the ad revenue. I was like, oh, wow, this could actually be a career. Okay, let's do this, do this. No one really cares that I'm writing novels, but they like my videos. So that's my life, I guess. And I've been doing it ever since. Did it, did it work? Did you actually, um, I mean, I don't know if it's easy to track, but do you think that it, did you see like an uptick no. of sales, uh, you know, in correlation to, to you, know, um, you know, sticking those advertisements at the end of the, at the reviews? No, there was definitely a few like extras, but I mean, I think I sold four or five copies of book two. Nothing, just <laughs> not even worth mentioning. <laughs> People love the reviews. They did not care about the books. 
And that was okay. Like I, I get the appeal of mice and gaming. It's instantly awesome. Reading takes time. Exactly. You know what? It's, it, this is actually so um, analogous to what we were just talking about at the, at the beginning of this conversation where, you know, you're talking about um, Quake doesn't have kind of the instant gratification that, that, you, that you have in most of these modern games. And like reading is kind of similar. Like if you, the contrast, I mean, it's effectively just about, uh, you know, taking in information and that's, that's engaging or relevant for one reason or another. And people mostly are conditioned to consuming information through the media, like very bite-sized mediums. So it's like the, the expectation, that, again, like the, the philosophy there is very different. So it feels like, yeah, we're kind of conditioned out, out of reading even more maybe. But I want to keep going down this thread of, of, of mouse re- you know, re- uh, reviewing and you know, we started the chronology, we, we looked at the, the origins and it's, you, know, you started to see success and you, you, know, you saw, you saw if, even if you didn't kind of recognize it as such, you know, it seems like you saw an opportunity to really fill a gap in the market to kind of help to like, serve, uh, you know, serve people with the kind of information that you think that they needed and that you were uniquely suited to, to give with your perspective. Um, so what, what started to happen as you started to see more and more success? As you say, you, know, you start to see some you know, revenues here and there and people start to send you stuff. But um, how, did, how did that process work in terms of how it kind of, you know, um, like, you know, you would, I presume you were spending more time on it. So how did you balance that with whatever else you were doing at that time in your life? Did, were you having to drop other priorities um, to, to invest more time? Were you having to you know, spend more money and, and try to upgrade your setup to improve things? You know, how, how did that kind of progress look? So how I've lived my life is basically work for a year or so, save all the money I can, and then just drop everything and go back to writing novels. So I, I'm on and off with my jobs all the time. It's this way that I think, the way that I function, the way, the, probably the reason I do so many things is because I'm always changing. But at the time, uh, I had lost my job a year before. Unfortunately, the business I was working at closed down. I had saved enough money. I moved back home with my parents, thanks to them. And I was just working on my music, my novels and all that. And then doing the reviews, it's just sort of, it was like, why not? I've got time to spare. And it was pretty interesting at the time. It was fun watching all the views go up. Uh, just so you know, my graphs was looking like this. It was just constantly going up every day. I was really, really encouraging. The comments were great. I was actually spending about three hours just replying to people every day. It was so fun just talking to everyone. And so how it looked, I guess, um, ad revenue came in and all that, but the drive became, you know, I can really influence this industry with uh, what I have with my experience. So because I'd been playing this game that was basically just all about aim, I have this really unique perspective on what actually makes a good mouse. And I had a lot to learn. Like I had no idea what I was really saying. I knew what I felt, but I didn't understand why I was feeling that way. So I'd give my perspective on these things. And I started to realize like, if I actually just tell the companies, stop using laser sensors, they're skipping. I didn't know why. I didn't understand the science behind it, but I knew laser sensors were terrible. They always had some kind of delay or just, as I said, the skipping, the jolting sort of thing. Uh, you actually had to use a hard pad and 800 DPI to get the best performance out of a laser sensor, or they had a lot of smoothing on it, in which case you'd have a lot of delay and just don't even go there. So I was like, all right, well, if everyone subscribes to me, I will be the voice of the gamer in the community saying to these companies, hey, we're here, we're a big audience, we're worth catering to, please start making mice for us. And they actually started listening. So the goals were always changing. At first I was just like, oh, hey, let's see how many views I can get on my videos to see if I can promote my novels. And then it was about how do I influence the industry? Like, can we get the mice we've always wanted? And then after that, uh, it started to get more and more serious and I started to really help companies design mice. I had a few offers, you know, will you design one for us and all that? And I thought, all right, well, if the deal is there, then maybe. Uh, but otherwise, it was a very slow process. It was mainly me just putting out ideas. Bit of a fun fact, the Logitech G Pro Wireless, you know, the God Mouse, that exists because the Logitech team were watching my videos, heard me talking about lightweight and wireless, and they said, let's do it. We'll take on the challenge. And the crazy guys actually did it. So I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that mouse is, is extremely, I mean, 
uh, you know, it's got some great marketing behind it as well in terms of like who the kinds of people that that really love it and that it really does seem to be the mainstream mouse now right i think i think that is the mouse for most people uh the g pro wireless seems to be the pinnacle i mean i i know that um i think you and i both have some different perspectives on 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 that and i kind of want to you know start leading the discussion there but but is that is that correct is that mouse kind of the pinnacle right now oh it's one of the top dogs for sure uh, the Razer Viper gives it a bit of a run, but the G Pro Wireless has been around, I think it was a year before the Viper Ultimate. So it already had its fan base established. So yeah, it is top dog, I think. Even still, a lot of the pros rely on that one. And I also say here that back in the day, I remember the G502 and the G402 and all the space age crazy weird designs that Logitech were doing. I always kept on going at them about them, like, stop over designing your mice. You don't need to do this. Please make them as lightweight as possible. We don't need like an extra fringe on the button. It just adds extra weight for no reason. So they came out with these designs, the G403 and the G Pro Wireless with this. I think this, I never actually confirmed this, but I'm pretty sure it was because I kept on handing them about like stop over designing your mice. And that's why we got these really nice shapes from them now. Yeah, that's awesome. Definitely things are going in a better direction. I think last year or so, it feels like mice have definitely... There's been like some stalling points definitely over the last like decade or so and some points of the growth, but it feels like we're in a really good spot now. Uh, I think there's lots of reasons for that. And and um we can start to talk about that now because obviously, you know, do you manage to get to a point as you were alluding to, you have these offers to come through to design your own mouse and you manage to do it and it's 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 brilliant. It's, it's fantastic. I've got, I've got it right here. And um yeah, I, I, I unfortunately, because I'm, I'm traveling right now, I don't have like a proper, you know, performance setup to really put it, put it through its paces as I like to do with mice. But I, I'm really enjoying the, the shape massively because I'm someone that is, it's, because it's funny because I, you know, as a Quaker, I think generally speaking, most Quake players, I think if you look at the average sensitivity used by most Quake players, it tends to be on average quite a bit higher than the averages or faster than the averages. For people playing tactical FPS games like Counter Strike and Valorant, and and even also, um, I would say that the same kinds of uh, sensitivities and averages are, uh, from tactical FPS is also present in most in games like PUBG as well. Maybe Fortnite's a bit faster, but generally speaking, you know, Quakers have faster sensitivities. And one of the things uh, I've I've noticed about about this is that if it, it's not really nearly as suitable to a grip that is more palm. And, and arm dominant necessarily because if you if you have that grip with a really fast sensitivity then you just don't have quite the the kind of my the kind of uh, control that you need um you don't have that same deafness and manipulation uh, or the ability for, for manipulation precisely as precisely with small distances as you would with your fingers so we're talking about claw and fingertip grips which is definitely more predominant with quake players but that's you know as we just sort of, sort of highlighted is that that's generally a smaller market and so, as someone also who has small hands, um, and actually, by the way, Diamondback was the first mouse that I was like playing at a professional level on. So there's definitely some similarities there. Um, I learned to kind of be a fingertip and claw kind of person, and I don't think that there's a lot on the market that really serves that very well. Even the the, the final mouse, Ultralight Two, which for me is a mouse that uh, does it very well. There still seems to be something. I don't know. What, I actually have been really struggling to explain this, but for me, there's still something off about it. And I think that you actually managed to solve some of those issues because of the, I don't know, the indentations that you have around the uh, around the actual uh, mouse one and mouse two buttons, which allow you to kind of maintain your grip even when you're kind of using your fingertips a lot. And that's that's a that for me was a really big deal. Something that I didn't realize was something that i needed but then after trying out your mouse i'm like okay this solves a problem because when i have been putting the final mouse ultralight 2 through its paces sure i've got really good aim and i can do loads of crazy stuff with it but i have this issue in in losing the grip um and, and i don't seem to have that with my testing on this mouse because of how you've actually created much more control and stability around the actual um mouse one and mouse two buttons so I feel like, um, you know, for me, I was very happy because I feel like you're servicing people that are more fingertip and wrist-based or and claw-based players that need that um, sec um, that secure feeling around the mouse buttons that I don't think has really happened in a mouse that's otherwise also very good overall in its shape. So I actually don't know where I'm going with this, but I do think 
<laughs> but I do think that you've done a really good job with the mouse that you've created here. Um, and I feel like you've created an additional innovation. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, in, you know, your innovation going into making your first mouse, I presume there will be others. Um, so how did you come upon this realization that, you know, these are some of the design features you needed to have in this mouse? How did you understand that in the first place? So it's been years and years of testing hundreds of mice, literally hundreds. And I mean, this was made out of clay. Like I actually just shaped it in my fingers and I was looking for a certain feel. And comfort curves in the buttons or comfort grooves, as I used to call them, you can actually not even hold the mouse. So watch, I'm just trying to get this lined up. You can actually move the mouse without actually touching it with any other fingers. And that's something that you can't really do on other mice because comfort curves give you that groove where you can push it left and right. So you do get a bit of extra control. What I will say about fingertip grip and claw grip, the reason I'm recommending it these days is for palm grip to actually work, you need a pretty big mouse to actually become comfortable. And as I said at the beginning, I found that I was aiming better with smaller mice. So even if you're playing CSGO, you actually may want to look at a smaller mouse and trying to transition to fingertip and claw grip. I used to palm grip, by the way, on the death adder. So I had to change my grip uh, with the Zowie FK2. That was my mouse. That was like the defining moment. I was like, oh, wow, I need to actually change my grip. I can aim so much better if I do it this way. Um, you should do it because you get to use smaller mice. And the smaller it seems, especially at the grip width, so I say just between the fingers there, that measurement right there is what I call the grip width. And that's kind of like I related to sort of imagine you're holding a pen. If you're holding a pen like this, how well do you think you can write? The answer is not very well. You write with a very thin pen, though, you can actually get very precise detail. It's kind of the same with the mice. So we want that grip width to be as thin as possible without getting to the point where we're cramping up and being too uncomfortable. Uh, I was going to say something about hold on, grip width, pen. Oh, that's right. The button heights. Keeping the fingers as low to the pad as possible. That's one reason why a lot of people are actually finding they can aim this mouse so well. Because that's something that I found on a few other mice. Too many to mention, but. I found like the lower the button height, the lower to the pad that I could feel, like I was more in control. So there's these little, like I call it aim science now, or aim theory. There's these things that you can put on a mouse that, and actually design it in such a way that does actually allow you to improve your aim. Like you can noticeably tell the difference. I usually say two, three weeks on any mouse before you can really adjust to it. After that period, you should know if you can aim well with it compared to the other ones or not. And I've been basing all my reviews on this one principle going through. So small in the mouse, how small can you go? And can you aim better with it or not? That's the main defining point of my reviews. Can they be aimed? I don't care if they look great, have all the RGB in the world. I know mine has a fair bit RGB, but ignore that. That was extra fine. I, I like it, by the way. It's, I don't hate it. Um, I don't care if it has like a higher weight, lower weight as such. It's, well, what are we going to aim better with? What's going to actually help improve our play? Some people call me out on biases sometimes, but it's like, it's not bias because I don't actually have a dog in the race or a horse in the race. I don't care who wins. I just want to win. So even with my mouse, like I'm not even biased for that because if I can aim better with another mouse, I'm using that mouse. There's no way I'm losing in Quake just to save my own ego with my design. No way. I want to win in Quake. As soon as I'm in that game, it is pure game set mindset. I'm not caring about anything else other than, can I get the victory? And that's how, like, before my mouse, that's all I was judging. So I didn't care if it was Final Mouse, Logitech, Razor. Like, can I win with it? Which one am I going to use? And I really illustrated that or demonstrated that in the Logitech G, hang on, G Pro X, Superlight, damn Logitech names. So one thing I want them to improve <laughs> upon, their names are just so confusing. So the G Pro X Super Light, the one that's now about 60 grams, I prefer the Viper Ultimate shape. To me, that is more like the FK2. It's a nicer shape for me. And I think I can aim that better. But the weight reduction of about 14 grams, I kept on reaching for the G Pro X. I was, I was like, yeah, this is going to be an easy win for the Viper Ultimate. I'm going to feel bad about hating on the Logitech team in this video. But I actually kept on reaching for the G Pro X. And that's how I was winning these games. Like every time I'd reach the ultimate, trying to win, I kept on coming up just a little bit short. And against these guys that were actually quite good players, I needed to be at my best. 
And I was like, all right, out of these two mice, I've got to give it to the Gpro X. That's the mouse. And that's when I realized 14 grams versus, sorry, 14 grams lighter versus a shape that I prefer, I'm going to go with the lighter mouse. When that stops being true, I'm not sure yet. The shape will have to be really bad before I take the lower weight. But it's, it's sort of teaching me that like, there's a balance point with all this. It can be the lightest weight on the mouse on the market. It's still not going to be the one you choose if the shape isn't right. And it could have the best shape. And if it's too heavy, you're not going to choose it either. So you need to find that balance of all these different principles that I'm finding in this aim theory, as I'm calling it, to actually have the best performance. So that's been the goal. That's still my goal. And that's what I try to keep the top mice list on my website updated, even though I'm not doing reviews so much anymore, because it's actually important. And especially pros, I hope they're paying attention because even though I've seen them play amazing on terrible mice, I keep on telling them, imagine how much better you would be with the right mouse. Like, give these other ones a go or in the off season. Not while you're trying to compete. Don't change it up then. Do it when it's safe. But definitely try these lighter mice with the better shapes, with all this latest technology, because they will help you aim. Once you get used to them, they will help help you aim. It's it's really interesting because it's almost I felt like a self fulfilling prophecy a little bit when it comes to the mice shapes and, and the mice that are popular versus what you're able to do with them. And so it might kind of mislead you. And so, so what I mean by that is that if you have uh, bigger shapes and uh, of course, you know, more palm based and so on, and you know, heavier weights and, and, and so on, it's going to be the case that when you're actually trying to track models or flick the models in the game, it, it, you're going to be forced into using certain grips and those certain grips will also will very much encourage you to using certain sensitivities. So you're almost kind of, you're, you're having to learn specifically because of the kinds of instruments that are available to you. So I've, I think that's like a really interesting thing that I've noticed um, in my experimentation because I've also really tried to make the G Pro wireless work because I keep reaching for it as well because I'm like, this feels good, but something's wrong, but it still feels good and it feels good enough that I want to play with it, but something still feels wrong. And, it, and for me, it's, it's because I... It's like, again, I have pretty small hands and it's like, I can't quite get the, the grip around the mouse. Like it, it, it just, I just feel that lack of precision. I can still aim really well on it, um, but, the, but there is just something wrong there. And it's really hard to put it into words. But you know, I think it's very easy to overcomplicate things when it comes to aiming. And it's interesting all of the different tools and knowledge that we have now. And because we have, for example... I mean, you know, it used to be the case that, you know, Quake was the best aim trainer effectively because it is, you know, it's, it's, it basically is like, you know, jumping into aim lab and you're doing a flicking or a tracking task. You're just combining some movement on top of it. But it's just so pure in, in the sense that there's not really many obstacles and you can rinse and repeat uh, very easily uh, because, you know, if you play FFA, you just respawn. You know, it's, it's, it's basically an aim trainer as close, as close to it as you like. And these days we have, um, you know, aim trainers specifically. We have, all these different mice shape. We have all these different people that professionals that use different standards. Uh, and another thing, you know, that I think is really interesting about weight is is how does that also relate to again your your grip preference? Um, how dominant you are in terms of let's say if you are a claw grip player, how much arm do you actually use versus wrist? How dominant are you in those areas in your particular preferences? And then how does that also relate to the friction of the mouse pad? And how does the weight of the mouse relate to the friction of the mouse pad in terms of, you know, how much energy it takes to, to stop the mouse and to keep the mouse in motion? And all the, it's like a lot of things to get really complicated about it. And I know that I'm sure that this is such an easy place to fall into, but I feel like aiming is also super simple at the same time. So are you able to kind of speak to this kind of it's complicated, but it should be simple type of dynamic? I mean, I can relate it back to, I always think about people bodybuilding or weightlifting a lot. And you know, you can get a lot of gains in the first year or so, I think it is. Then after that, to get that little bit of extra gain, it's a lot harder work. It's kind of the same with mice. I mean, I've played with a ball mouse, you know, the original mouse that I was playing Quake 2 with. I actually jumped in game and I got top score on my team with that. It's like, how much do you really care about aim? You don't need to go really in depth with this stuff. And I will say like 400 DPI, 1600 DPI, there's not that big a difference. You can play with either. I recommend 1600 because there are benefits to it, but it's not that important. And the same thing goes for which mouse pad you're using, which mouse 
But at the same time, like we're competitive, it's fun, it's a hobby, and it's really cool to see just how well you can do. So yeah, it can get overcomplicated, but at the same time, it's kind of worth it. And I'm also just trying to simplify it by narrowing down the choices. So I do all the testing with all that experience. So you don't have to go through those years and years of trying these things out. And as far as my sensitivity goes, I use about 30 centimeter 360. So it's 1600 DPI at around 0.92, 0 0.82, 0 0.74, anywhere in those margins, like I can usually play just fine. So I use a pretty high sensitivity. You wouldn't be using that in CSGO, although I do, and I do headshots just fine at times. So I think it's okay, but I know a lot of CS players will go for that lower sensitivity and they will use their arm a lot more. I've seen arm or mouse cams where it's, they're really doing these massive movements and you don't see that with me. Like I do flicks for the 180s. Other than that, I'm very much uh, in control of my mouse, turning when I need to, but that's like, it's not, I'm not doing giant swings all the time, whereas the CSGO players are, not all of them, but. The ones we're talking about definitely do that. And yeah, I would love to research this more because I think you've met asking some very good questions and it's something that I haven't actually looked into yet. When these people are using palm grip and using their arm to aim more than say fingertip like I am, is a different kind of mouse going to suit them better? Or is it just one size fits all? You just have to go that smaller mouse, get everyone using fingertip claw grip, a little bit of palm maybe, and then let them do their thing because a smaller mouse is always going to be easier to aim because there's always that sense of precision in your hand. Uh, the higher button height example, if your fingers are up like this, it just doesn't feel as stable to me. I don't know about other people, but for me, it definitely doesn't feel as stable as opposed to my fingers down like that, close to the pad. So I don't know the answers to these questions yet. It's an interesting topic. Yes, it could be overcomplicating it, and maybe it doesn't matter that much. As I said, one size fits all. Mouse could be the thing. G Pro Wireless is doing great. Uh, if you had a bigger hand, you probably wouldn't be having the issues you're experiencing. I think it is the hand size doing that because I feel the same. My hand, I think it's roughly the same as yours. So I would definitely be feeling what you're feeling. And my theory is that because it's about 5.98, 6 centimeter grip width, as opposed to my mouse, which is 5.25 centimeter, that's a big difference. And that when it comes to mice, that's a massive difference. Uh, a few millimeters, a few millimeters here and there actually goes a long way. So G Pro Wireless, a bit too wide. If you narrowed it down, I think you'd play a lot better, but it's also pretty high. That'd keep it in your hand higher. If they lowered the button height and then reduced the grip width, you'd probably find that's one of your top mice as well. You have like 300 plus mice, you said, right? Slaying around. Is, is, is it not, do you not have moments um, yourself where you're thinking, oh God, I just didn't hit? Real well, well enough, but on this mouse, I mean, man, I, last time I, you know, I remember using that mouse. My rail was like so good. I'm going to switch to that because I want to feel, I want to feel that <laughs> right now. Do you have that problem? No, not at all. I know exactly which mouse to use at all times, which is only one at a time. I'm never changing between them unless I'm doing a review. So to go back to the point, yeah, mental game is huge, and part of the uh, perfect storm of my channel, I guess you could call it, is that because I've been playing this one game for so long against the same people all this time, like we're talking 10, 15 years for all of them. I know exactly who is better than me and worse than me. I know exactly if I should win certain fights or not. And I know if I'm not feeling good that day or I'm feeling amazing that day, I know how it's going to affect my performance. So when I'm going to these mouse reviews, I'm review removing a lot of those variables which could be just the mindset of the day, which could be the how much I've slept, what I've eaten, um, just the lag or the connection. I'm seeing all this and just focusing on the mouse. I know when I'm having a bad day, I'm not blaming the products. So that's why I can cut through all this and just say, well, all right, well, which one's actually going to help me aim best and which one's going to help other people aim best too? At a guess, obviously, I don't know everyone and a lot of my recommendations are just based on whether I think they can aim well or not. But I'm getting pretty close and a lot of people have said, like, thank you so much for helping me choose the right mouse because apparently I got it right. It's been very encouraging. It's great to see. But yeah, so I've removed a lot of those variables. But I always say to people, the right mouse is not going to make you pro. You still have to learn the game. 
I was still able to top score my team with that ball mouse I just spoke about. And it's not because the mouse is amazing, it was terrible. The ball alone weighs 30 grams. We're getting mice now that are only 10 grams heavier than that with the new finer mice. It's crazy. So clearly game sense, understanding the game, actually playing the game, these are very important factors. And also knowing who you're better than, whether someone's cheating or not, that's actually a factor too. Hopefully rare, but I've heard of it and I've seen it. It's bad. Um, but yeah, so eliminating all those factors and just not blaming the mice and actually learning to play the games, very important. And then once you've got all that set, and hopefully you get to that stage where you can understand which of the variables affecting you that day, and then testing the mice. And if you still can't get comfortable, look, change. I mean, there's no law against switching it up all the time. You can, but at some point you're going to be hurting yourself you do have to find one and stick with that for at least a month or two, I would say. Like really just keep on using it and just try it. If your hand is cramping up for three weeks, yeah, change. You're not ready for that mouse yet. So maybe you need a transition mouse. Maybe you need something in between. Maybe you're going from an EC1 from Zowie down to a Razor Viper Mini. Your hand is going to kill. Like it's too big a size difference. So maybe go from the EC1 down to the EC2, then go to the Viper Mini. But you have to give yourself time to adjust to these things, but make sure you're learning the game, monitoring what you're eating. I do a lot of self-help videos for this exact reason, because I know it's not just all about mice. I agree with you. People need to get their exercise routines happening. They need to get their relationships in order. They need to get their work life feeling where it should. They need to actually get their future goals. Your mindset, your everyday mindset, part of being happy is actually achieving something new every day making sure you're feeling like you're getting ahead. If you just get stuck in the rut in that one game and repeating the same process over, over and over, you just slowly go down. You won't even really feel it. Like it's like such a gradual change. It's like mountains being worn away by the wind and the rains, just slowly eroding you away. And you won't even realize it's happening before it's too late and you're down in the dumps and feeling terrible. And that's when your performance really takes a hit. And you're like, why am I even here? Gaming is meant to be fun but I'm not even having fun anymore. This is not enjoyable. I'm sucking. Everything sucks. I hate this. <laughs> Rage quit. Get out. Done. So you need to take the mindset with the mice. The mice are just about unlocking the potential. It's not about making you better as such. It's just allowing you to be your best for what you're actually capable of doing right now. And if you find you're hitting a skill ceiling, I did a video about this. It's not about breaking the skill ceiling. It's about raising it. And the way to raise it is by doing something new and bringing something new. And that's where a new mouse forced to learn something new can actually help or playing a new game or going outside and learning a sport or talking to someone new, learning something scientific, like something cool about the universe. Just expand your mind in some way because you're going to come back to that game in three, four months or so, or maybe a few weeks with a totally different perspective or just a slightly different perspective, but it's just enough to raise that skill selling to there. And that puts you above everyone else just a little bit. And like, I've just taken up drums. I don't know if you can see them. No, you can't. Okay. So I've got an electronic drum kit just to teach my brain to keep rhythm. There you go. You can see it. So I bought that uh, just a few months ago, just to get that rhythm going and learn how to use both feet, both hands, get that coordination happening. And funnily enough, I now go into games with a bit more sense of awareness and ability to do things like my brain can multitask better. So you add the, oh, I can also juggle. I learned that, uh, what was it five, six years ago? Just cause I'd never been able to do it. I always dropped the balls completely and looked terrible. But I went, no, I want to try this. I've got to get my brain to figure this out. And now I've got better hand eye coordination and I can juggle rocks down on the beach. I can even juggle. I should juggle some wireless mice, really put people on edge. <laughs> Don't drop it. that will be fine though. Cause I can actually juggle quite well. I won't be dropping these things. I can spin the basketball on my finger, change hands, change fingers, hit off my knee three times, get it back on. I just, I'm always challenging myself in little ways because I'm trying to increase my mental abilities. And I write novels where I have to remember what every character said, what every character did. I've written three novels now. All of them are over 135,000 words. These are not small. These are not easy. This is very challenging. The hardest thing I do is actually writing the novels because it's such a memory exercise plus creativity, plus actually getting the word structure right and the sentences as they should be, the paragraphs, not doing chapters too long, not putting people off with like terrible, boring bits or whatever. There's so much, it's like you're building entire worlds 
in written format. And you have to get it all right because if you make any little mistake, people are right there to say, uh, oh, this sucks. I'm completely taken out of the story now. I don't like it. So getting back to it, when you're gaming, you need to, I mean, I actually say in the how to get good series to be at your best. You have in games, you have to be at your best in life. You can't just game for 10, 12 hours a day and think that's going to be sustainable at a really high level for a long time. You need to get your life in balance, in check. Make sure you're exercising. Make sure you're eating the right foods. I actually say avoid uh, substances like caffeine and all that because I figure it like spikes you. I'm trying to get a more consistent flow. So I like my mind to be at a very stable sense the whole way through while I'm gaming in life. I'm trying to bring back my emotions. I don't know if you know Tim Duncan, San Antonio Spurs basketball player. One of the greatest. I'm not familiar, actually. Okay, so Tim Duncan was one of the best of all time at his position. And he'd have these huge wins, like underdog, come out on top, somehow win. And then I kept on watching these spots, just paying attention to these professional athletes under so much pressure. Like, how are they keeping their minds in that good sense? And Tim Duncan used to come out and go, you know, the reporter would be like, you know, you must be so excited. This is amazing. How did you, like, you got out this win. That's incredible. You got the game winner and everything. He'd be like, yeah, it was a good shot. Uh, we still have some things to work on. Uh, it's always, you know, got to look for the next game and see what we can improve upon. We'll watch the tape back and we'll talk about it. But no, we did well today, but, you know, definitely things we can improve and it's always that next game. And I'm like, okay, that's genius. Cause that's actually, he's not going, yeah, this is amazing. And then when he loses, oh, everything sucks. Why am I even playing? Oh, yeah, it's amazing. I won again. No, I lost. It sucks again. He's not like that. He's just like, win or lose. He's just that stable sort of flow point right in that central layer. Like he is just so on the level, so steady. I'm like, that's genius because you can actually keep yourself in the game, focusing, pay attention. Emotion distracts. Look, emotions, it's very important. Don't get me wrong. If you use emotion in the right way, it can give you the edge. But a lot of the time, emotion is blind. There's a reason that we have that love is blind. That's the strongest emotion you're going to feel other than that survival one and all that. When you fall in, <clears throat> sorry, when you fall in love with someone, it's the strongest emotion. Your life becomes about them. You just want to think about them, be around them all the time. It's super, super strong. And you don't see all the red flags. Like other people might be warning you, like that person's not who you think they are. You're about to do something really stupid, but it's blind because the emotion is just overwhelming all your logical and ability to actually understand reality, all those senses just sort of go out the window. So I figure it's the same even on small amounts of emotion. The more you use the emotion, the less you're actually... I need a drink. You talk for a second. <laughs> no, it's... it's um, yeah, emotion is a really interesting one, um, for sure. I think um, someone that um, I respect massively that I think speaks to it really well is... is I, I feel like I'm his fanboy at this point because I promote his work so much. But Jared Tendler, you know, he's um, one of the people that I feel like has communicated this the best in terms of performance. And and it, what the one of the ways that he puts it is, you know, emotions are signals. It's not necessarily like it, it, one of the big problems is that we just generally don't know what to do with them because no one really communicates and tells you how to how to deal with them. And it, it's very easy to under, understand that. Oh, I don't, I you know, I, I'm frustrated or I'm angry. There's a trigger here, and I can just walk away. And it, it goes away because I walked away and I created space, but that trigger still, still exists. So there's, there is a signal that emotion is a signal that there's something there that's triggering you, that's creating a negative response. And if you're able to actually understand what that is, you can, you can work through it. You can have a better, maybe it's the case that you need a better process or you need more knowledge or you need a different approach. You know, there's, there's, there's a, and there's underlying other aspects to it. Like maybe you just, you already need the win for some reason that's connected to something else. Like, it's just a raw signal. And, and um, if you do really good work, then you, you're going to be experiencing less of the negative. And as you say, you're going to be able to maximize focus because the negative stuff, especially that really is distracting. Like it, it distracts your focus. You can't dial into that flow state as effectively. You can't dial into that intuition system that you're coding. Um, as you get more and more experience playing the game, just that ability to just know it precisely the one option of a thousand options in that precise specific moment automatically just know that that's the best play. Like that system that's happening, like being able to see the future. It's like are you, you're not necessarily seeing the future, but your brain's just able to model things so correctly. You, you can only really access and tap into that 
with this is you know this unfettered focus that's not distracted by the more complex emotional environment that you could be subjected to and i think that example is really awesome that you're saying because it's like um i forget the player's name you were describing but he's just still in that mindset of, of just not even he's not outcome oriented he's like he's just focused on how do i be the best and this is what it takes to be the best and this is the, the approach and the process for me to be the best and i'm not looking for the reward the instant gratification i'm not looking for the the big emotional surge right now that's not what this is about this is about my long-term goals and i think that's what you're talking about too like understanding that vision day to day of like this is this is what it's really about i could choose this but i'm going to choose this instead to stay on point to stay focused so i can i can keep being the best and that's a story i want for myself so it's it's uh, that focus is is interesting too because it's you know I, I always say you know focus every day is finite you know you have to decide how to allocate that resource and how to best look after that resource as well and yes yeah, so I, I don't know if i just you know completely just took everything in the wrong direction because you just gave me a moment there to because <laughs> you need to take a drink and i i just not passing the ball back but i'll pass the ball back to you now no, you're spot on. That's exactly what I was talking about. So Tim Duncan was all about the championship. Once he won the championship, that's when all the emotion came out. That's when he let it out and actually let himself feel something. But until then, every game was just a step. It's just a process. You fall in love with the process. Uh, I try to tell my followers not to focus on results so much because you got to fall in love with that process of life. I mean, we have so many sayings about it. Uh, it's, it's never the start or the end. It's the journey in between. It's that same principle all the time. It's not just about life, though. It's about every little thing you do. It's the process. Fall in love with that process. Your goals, your direction, like that's for direction, where you want to go. But I mean, my goal was to be a best-selling author. Now I'm on YouTube with my own mouse. I mean, if I was, nope, this is my goal. I have to stick with it and just go with that. I would not be where I am today and I would not be in a good position. But because I'm open and I just... I sort of tell people, like, just imagine it as your guiding star. You choose a star in the sky, and then you follow that star. You don't know what lands you or countries you're going to discover. You just go island to island. You keep on chasing that star, sure. But you'll probably never get to that star. But is that so bad? It's not. That's just your guiding, like, that's your goal. That's where you're going to go. You're trying to get to the star. And someday, maybe once we master space travel and the amazing distances, Maybe we'll get there. But for now, we're just experiencing that journey and it's all about that next step. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And trying to nullify the highs and lows with these uh, mental states and just making sure we're focused on the right thing is super, super helpful in playing at our best and getting into that flow state. I think it's Satori, it's the old samurai state, that's what they called it. When the samurai get into their flow state with a sword, I think it's Satori. Maybe someone can Google it for us, but it's been throughout the ages. Anyone who's very skilled or competitive or constantly fighting or challenging or just trying to be the best they can be sort of realizes that it's a state where if you clear your mind and be completely focused on what the actual task is, you can achieve stuff that you're almost blown away by a lady. You're like, how did I do that? Cause it's like how, like it's almost inhumanly possible, but I figure, I don't know if you want me to try to explain it, but I can try. We have subconscious and conscious mind. So the subconscious is like a computer. You just said we have limited focus. Absolutely right. Uh, Rafa, always uh, the Quake champion for how many years? Absolute god tier Quake player. Rafa, if you don't know about him, go check him out. Love the guy. Uh, he actually talks about what kind of practice are you doing? Like he can go into a game and just practice uh, shooting for five hours. But what if your movement is the issue? Maybe you're not moving well enough. So he says you should be focusing on, well, he doesn't say that, but I'm using this as an example. You focus on movement. You focus each day, like where do you need to improve? That's what your practice should be about. That's where your focus is. That's what your limited focus is going to be about. It's about this thing that you need to improve on. So yeah, you have limited focus. You have limited range, limited everything. Use it wisely and get to where you need to go. Where was I going with this again? I lost the uh, point. Uh, Satori? Satori, getting to the flow state. Oh, that's right. So the subconscious mind is there to be programmed with your focus. Whatever you're focusing on, whatever you're filling your time with, that's programming your subconscious computer. So imagine installing all the bad software on your computer, then wondering why it's not running so well. That's when you eat junk food. 
That's when you watch trash on YouTube or read garbage magazines or just get involved in drama. Uh, that's you when you're not playing the best um, as you should be. You need to fill your mind. You need to program your subconscious with the right stuff. Be aware of every thought you think because that's going to come out in the most intense moments. That's why good training is so valuable. So you make the right decision. I sort of relate it back to tennis. Imagine you haven't practiced your backhand well enough. And then Roger Federer, or imagine he didn't. And then Nadal hits him with an amazing backhand and he has to try return with the backhand, but he hasn't done the training properly. So he's thinking, oh, I just do this. But he's thinking, overthinking it. And then he misses the ball completely. It's like, this is bad. Like, this is a result of bad training. These guys are that good because they train so much with perfect execution during their off time that once they get into the game, they free up their conscious minds, which is a really finite, finite resource you have. Being able to focus on all the other variables that you can't predict during practice. What if the wind is doing this? What if the crowd is doing this? What if uh, he's playing a different way? What if he's sitting, uh, hitting to my forehand instead of backhand? You need to program your subconscious so you just instant. It's meant to be like reactive. It's uh, it's your nature. It's something that you just instantly hit or do in response to whatever input you're getting, and you don't need to think about it. You just respond. So it has to become reactionary. And that's why that right practice, right frame of mind is so important. Because as you just said, focus is limited. What are you focusing on? What are you filling up your brain with? Because that's going to come out in those moments you really don't want it to come out. Yeah, so the, the whole intuition system is, is a really fascinating one. And um, it's, it's something I've been really obsessed with because I, that, that, that's the, the quandary that you're describing really is, I think, one of the next ways we... We get the best athletes, the next generation of, of best athletes. We we innovate the training because you know there's been that premise for so long that just you just have to practice a lot. But that's so meaningless because just for the reason that you 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 know started to to bring up with the, the way that you use Rafa as an example and just a focus practice. And say, like, okay, we well, have focus practice, and you're trying to control. You want to have the best quality practice, but you know why is that the case? Well, okay, it's because every experience that you're having in the game is coding this intuition system is is your brain is your subconscious mind is doing all of this pattern recognition stuff that you're not consciously aware of but it allows you to to keep coding that intuition system and and a, a book that i reference a lot with this is uh, daniel kahneman's thinking fast and slow because he he was um the first person that really did a lot of work in this area and, and described described um you know intuition and expert intuition um but um, it still doesn't quite, I feel like it's still very young. And again, um, bringing up Jared Tendler here, someone who is a, such an expert in performance, he's, he's going to be releasing some stuff in the future about his version of, of, the, of the intuition system in performance and competition. And I feel like once we start to understand better how that functions, we're going to be able to tailor training better. Because one of the, the biggest things, uh, issues that people run into with training is that They'll they'll repeat patterns, and this this happens a lot actually. If you overtrain, or if you train when you, when you're you're too tired, or you you know too fatigued, you don't have a good sense sense for when you should stop training. You'll start you'll notice that you'll start making mistakes that you wouldn't normally make. You'll start just repeating decision making. Um, so it's just it's just just happening automatically in a sense that's not good for your your end performance. When as, as I was saying, you know, you're just letting it go. You're, it's like a trust exercise with yourself almost. You have to trust that you did the right training, that you've that up until that point, you've done all of the right things and that you don't have any doubts with that. And you can just go and perform and stay in that focused state and have a good, good quality of your mental game. But understanding what is the best way to train our intuition system so that we know all of the right answers so that we can hit the flow state most commonly. Um, that might not even be a, a, a concept, you know, the, the idea of, of flow state um is just how we sort of encapsulate encapsulate something that we've we found observable which is just the highest level of our performance um so is it actually a state that is achievable more often with the right kind of training um you know it's, it's really interesting because in a game we have a pretty set environment with set rules and this is why like we're able to have the ability to kind of quickly crunch the numbers and then understand the right decision because it's the idea that you know, you know, two plus two is four. You don't have to do the actual calculation. That's that's something that you understand intuitively. You just understand that through experience 
in the world. That's something that you see everywhere. It's just an intuitive thing that you understand. Maybe not the best example, but but yeah. So that, that to me is like a very fascinating quandary. If we can kind of solve that in terms of practice, so we can really start to understand what the brain is really doing and how to optimize it. That for me is like one of the next levels of training. Um, and speaking of which, we didn't actually discuss what you think the next level of mouse design is and innovation in mouse, because that's from I get the sense that you're kind of just getting started. Um, do you have a lot of gripes with the way that mouse design is looked at right now? And where do you think the next innovations are? So I don't have any gripes with them because now, like I saw so many people making so much money off the things that I was saying that I was like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't be giving this away for free. <laughs> and now people have said I'm a bit egotistic with that, but it's like, that's this business, man. Like if you've seen what I've said behind the scenes and how much of the top mice are from what I've said, we didn't have this many before. Mice are in a really good place, as you mentioned earlier. They're amazing to the point where you barely need to review them. They're actually so good now. So I'm like, yeah, maybe it's time I keep my ideas to myself and try to make some because I'm getting old and kind of want a house one day and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about too many things with where I think the mouse industry should go now because I'm going to work with certain brands, probably Extrify, and bring out something. I mean, I think I'm getting another mouse still at some point. Uh, we're going to see how this one does. Uh, but after that, I might be able to release something that's going to – like this is my safe entry. This mouse right here, this is a safe design. That's something that you can recognize as a mouse. The next thing that I'm doing, you can't really recognize it as a mouse. Ooh. So uh, if I can get it right, it'll be phenomenal. Or if I get it wrong, it'll just be a complete flop. But I'm very much like the risk of going all or nothing and just, I love to push boundaries and I love to think outside the box and see what we can actually achieve. This was a safe one, more for extra fire's benefit. I didn't want to throw them a curveball just yet. I <laughs> uh, wanted to, you know, get them thinking, oh yeah, he's a pretty good investment. He'll do well for us. And then next one, I'm going to be like, and they've actually said, yes, they're interested. So they're the risk takers as well. So it should be interesting. should be good to see. But uh, look, lightweight, wireless, but it's all about the shape after this. Uh, I don't think, I mean, we've been trying to think for a long time, how can we actually improve these mice to that next level? And we've thought about, you know, just doing the pen on pad thing. And like that kind of works, but not really. And I mean, maybe they'll perfect that tech one day and maybe that will be the best because then you're holding a pen, then you really have precision. That'd be incredible. But I don't know. We, I mean, okay, I won't say we, there's no way of doing it because I'm sure I'll be proven wrong by some scientist who says, well, actually, but for now, we cannot think of a new way. It's like, how do we get Quake back into the mainstream? It's like, yeah, there probably is a way, but we've been thinking about it for years and we still can't come up with an answer. And I think the same thing is with mice. All I can think of doing is changing up the shape in a big way to the point where you probably don't recognize it as a mouse anymore, but as an aim device, maybe. Yeah, so interesting. I'm just like, my, my head is sort of just visualizing different designs there. Um, but in that sense too, though, um, what are you, what are your viewpoints because uh, on fr on friction on pads and friction because it's a pretty I mean there's been some innovations in that market and I use an ice mat it's like a glass pad you know way back when um, because it was what Toxic used um, in, back in 2003 or whatever and and I wanted to aim like him and Toxic is probably one of the best aimers of all time in Quake uh, for those who don't know who that is um, and 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 it was always very interesting um, because with with a glass pad um, or very low friction. That was great back in the days when mice were a lot heavier, I have to say. I think it was one of the reasons why it was so good because mice in the old days were really heavy. But now, you know, I've because I went back to que re-question this assumption um, recently with all these light mice and I'm like, wow, it's actually very hard to control my, um, the, the kind of mice that we're using these days because they're just so light and and like a, and like they're much more precise, generally speaking, as, as you've been describing. So they're now every small just if i'm just off ever so slightly it just really makes a big difference and and really throws you off pretty massively uh with a with a pad with very low friction so i'm now starting to question all of all of those assumptions like and, and i'm not sure myself like with a with a pad and friction like what is an ideal pairing with the way that mice have been developing now do you have insight into into pads is that something an area that you're, you're going into yourself i do 
Want a sneak peek? Oh, yeah, I'll definitely take a sneak peek. It's an exclusive. Ooh, nice. And that looks like a cloth pad. to me. It is a cloth pad. You are correct. So this pad is coming out in the next, I think, month or two. Hopefully sooner than later. They've been working on it for a while. But basically they sent me, I wanted a mouse pad for myself because I've been using blue screen mouse pads. I'm like, I need the right material. And they sent me about 20 different material samples, I think. And plus I've used maybe 50 mouse pads or so now. I don't know. I've got boxes and boxes and stacks about, you know, well, if I stacked them on top of each other, I can't even put it in the camera frame. Very high stacks of mouse pads. And I've been testing all these different surfaces and yeah, you're onto it. I definitely felt the same sort of thing. I don't want to give away too much yet because it's going to be part of the special video I make about this mouse pad. But this surface, oh yeah, so I should explain. I went into testing all these mouse pads with clear mind. I was like, I'm not even going to think about this surface. I'm just going to play hours and hours and hours and see how well I do. And then I, I think it was about four or five of them really stood out. And then I realized that one of them only worked with the Ultralight 2 from Final Mouse. And that was because they had certain mouse feet. So the skates were made of a certain material that made that mouse pad really good, but it was terrible for all other mice with the default skates. So I was like, okay, well, this one's out the door. I can't use this one. But the other four pads, I kept on using those. I'm like, okay, I'm definitely playing really well on these, better than I've ever played before. But then I narrowed it down even further to just this one. Actually, it was two, but then I chose this one because this pad has this really special blend of friction and like speed and control that I don't want to go into too much yet, but I was topping the score so much more with this pad. And with light mice, yeah, I think you need a bit more control, but not too much. So we'll get into that later, but yeah, you're on the right track in my <laughs> opinion, in my testing. Uh, it's definitely something that we have to look at now that we have such lightweight mice. We don't need those ice pads, glass pads, chopping boards, whatever we use back in the day. You can actually go with a cloth pad now and aim extremely well. So I'll get onto that later, but yeah, you're on the right path. It's uh, this, the skates thing is an interesting one as well because you know there's, there's the, the classic PTFE feet. Um, and I know that you said that Final Mouse have done a really good job with their feet, actually. Um, I'm not sure if they're a different kind of PTFE, but um, is is our feet something that you've put a huge amount of thought into, or is it something that they're actually like a pretty good place? It's actually the stuff around them that matters more. I should probably put more effort into them, and I should have got more third party skates. But I've been so busy, I haven't really had the time to just look at that stuff. Um, but I mean, with the final mouse thing, I didn't even realize how much I like those feet until I got back to using other mice. And I was like, oh, wow, Fun Mouse actually did something really special. I remember them saying, we put a lot of uh, extra research into these mouse feet. They should be the best. And they're just severely underrated. And even I was like, oh, yeah, they're mouse feet, whatever. But then after using, like, using all these pads and realizing that the Fun Mouse actually played better on most of them than other feet, I'm like, okay, maybe there's something to this. We probably should look into these mice feet more. Nice. It's, um, I'm, well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to the pad especially because – uh, I, I think that that's been a search for me for quite a long time. It's just it's just a very difficult one, especially because there's another issue with with pads as well. In that, how quickly does dust, dirt, grime accumulate? How much does that impact things? How much of it's mental? Um, how often should you clean it? What I mean, there, there are obviously some, and you've got you know videos as well on your channel. Uh, you know, some good uh, methodologies in terms of cleaning and stuff. But it would be very cool if there was like. And I don't know if this is just unnecessary, but if there was also like a, a product that actually did that somewhat specifically, um, that said, it is just cloth and dirt and grime. So, like, <laughs> so, so I guess that in reality, it, is, it would just be branding something that already exists as a gaming thing, which I guess has been done with a lot of things. But, but yeah, I feel, I feel like best practices, I don't know what best practices are with that. Should you be doing it every other day? You know, what temperatures should you be drying it at if you want to dry it quickly? Because, you know, do you, do you have a spare that you swap in and out because it takes too long to dry otherwise? Because, you know, we, we don't, that's like the worst thing when you clean a pad right, is that you have to now just leave it to dry for a while. Um, so it's, you know, you probably would want another, another one so that you're not missing out on your gaming time if that's, 
you know time you wanted to spend practicing so um yeah is, do you think there's a uh, optimization there to be done sure uh, i don't know about the cleaning products i've actually found this method is the best way and you actually just when you get the mouse pad out just put it in a towel and dry it as much as you can and then you put it like near an open window uh out in the wind and dry it the best you can a little bit of sun on it, it's not going to damage it too much but at the same time be careful because it could damage the base like the rubber and all that too so i uh, definitely recommend watching that video it's only a minute long it's got like 2.5 million views now i think crazy i thought i was making that uh, video for like 5,000 people who are asking me on my channel <laughs> yeah and then it just blew up so i'm like yeah um and in that video i said just do the scratch test so just scratch it if you see dust it's probably time to clean it just doing mine yeah there's i mean this is a new pad why am i even scratching it yeah you can scratch yours see if uh you can Hang get on. any dust uh, coming uh, up. other stuff <laughs> yeah this one's really di- really really dirty uh there you go you can see that there yeah oh yeah that needs a clean that so, is it uh, needs a clean <laughs> it does need a clean um watch my video check it out but yeah i mean if you're not seeing much dust come up when you scratch it it's probably not worth it yet but if you start to feel the uh difference in the consistency then it's time to clean it for sure uh sometimes you might even like the extra uh control you might get with dust and I, I know i did i used to put just to give an example of just how much stupid stuff we used to do back in the quake days trying to get the advantage with, with all this i only had like a two dollar mouse pad garbage because i couldn't afford more but i was like all right well it doesn't feel like i'm getting enough control with this one anyway so i started putting like hair mousse on it hair mousse rubber hair mousse just tr- seeing if that would actually give me a bit more consistent feel or something and then that became bad so i put like a um what do you call it some spray that was like a, not an oil but it would actually speed up the feel of it or like a so like cooking oil not cooking oil i didn't go that far <laughs> it was it wasn't something like it wasn't a food substance but it was some sort of chemical thing oil thing like a lubricant that actually made it some sort of lubricant yeah and then, then i was like oh no that's too smooth now so i tried to find something else like hair gel or something just to put on <laughs> like i kept on trying to change the consistency of my mouse pad so when you're listening to my reviews and i talk about 23 years in quake it's 23 years in october by the way 20 almost 23 years in quake i have done so many things just to test things out and tried all these mice and these pads and these keyboard setups and all these configurations different sensitivities with uh acceleration without high sensitivity low sensitivity all in between we just we got really competitive and it was all about aim so it was like well yeah what can we do to get that advantage i remember going down to war like a shopping center almost said the name um just a local shopping center and buying a chopping board because someone said it gives you an advantage <laughs> and i was using my mouse on a chopping board it was just so ridiculous and people were like why have you got a chopping board on the desk i want to win in quake that's but- awesome don't judge i i love that i think i think that obsessiveness about the setup is is i mean that's obviously like that's what your channel is about really it's it's about taking a few specifics the most important parts arguably about of that which is the mouse um but i just love that obsessiveness of just like designing your setup and like it extends into so many different areas especially in the old days there'd be lots of things you'd be doing to try to optimize the how, how you know programs and it would run how your hardware would run there's just so many you know things are so well optimized out of the box these days that you don't have to worry about that kind of level of things but i feel like it is a very specific type of person um that is looking for all of those edges and trying to optimize everything and that's a, such a fun journey and experimentation so it's it's really fun to hear you sharing a lot of your stories um over the years of you doing that and um and of course it's it's resulted in some of the the amazing content that people like love so much about your channel um i'm i'm aware <laughs> that we've actually been talking for quite a long time at this point and there's so much more to talk to you about but that's okay. do you want it's to so be fun. respectful of your time and we'll have to do this again because i think um sure it's time to kind of you know wind things down a little bit here and and uh i do definitely want to talk about um a lot to do with you know you know your novels and sort of the more kind of personal stuff because i think you're a really interesting guy and um and you know also um the music as well i think i think we we share we share some things there so that's going to be a fun discussion as well but in terms of uh you know things to look out for it seems like you've given us you know you gave us a mouse pad sneak peek that's that's amazing thank you for doing that and uh you gave us some ideas to to you know uh, titillate 
our our senses a little bit as to what we could expect uh, with your mouse or your next mice, like you know the experiments you might try or the experimental versions of mice you might try in the future to change the game. Um, but yeah, so much more to talk about. Um, thank you, Zai. Um, any any closing uh, thoughts or things that you'd like to say before we we uh, close this one up? Yeah, don't make things a big deal. As soon as you make them a big deal, you're going to start failing because there's too much pressure. This whole thing is about minimizing pressure. Just try to live the best life you can. If you're not having fun, if you're not enjoying it, make a change. Be the best you can be. Find ways of doing that. Improve your diet. Improve your exercise routine. That's what we were talking about in the beginning. Make sure you're focusing better. Make sure you're practicing in certain ways that are actually going to help you. If you're raging, take a break. If you really can't deal with anger, as you mentioned earlier, if you're having those triggers constantly come up, actually look into why they're there. Figure out, figure it out. I've done a lot of study just to figure out my own brain, just so I can play better and improve on everything. And then once you get on this path, you start to realize that it improves everything in your life. So I've come from, we'll talk about this another time, but I've come from a depression state where I wanted to, you know, I was actually suicidal and everything it was really bad. But I've come from basically nothing. No one knew who I was. I grew up poor and all that. But I just kept on focusing on my passions and pushing myself to improve in every way that I could possibly think of. I was being creative as I could, just doing my own thing. Didn't really have any goals with it. And now you know who I am. Now I'm being interviewed or having a podcast session or whatever you want to call this. Like we're having this discussion we wouldn't ever have if I didn't actually just keep on pursuing these paths. So my message to everyone is just get that guiding star, get that goal, and then just keep on chasing it and just seeing what island you end up on. Embrace it. Embrace that journey. Find that flow state and just keep on going. That's beautiful. Thank you, Zai. And uh, I, I know that we'll be talking again. We will. Thank you so much for having me.